Hey everyone, Victor is here, your organic chemistry tutor, and today I want to do a quick summary overview of reactions of alkynes. Like in my overview of the alkenes, and the link in the description below, of course, I'm going to do the general overview here. So I'm not going to go over every single detail of the mechanism for every single reaction here. Rather, I'm going to focus on the most important features of each of those reactions. And if you wanted to review the details, I have the dedicated tutorial for each of those reactions in my alkynes playlist and of course I will add the link in the description below as well. So grab your cup of coffee and notebook to jot down the important parts, hit that like button for good luck on the test and let's get started. So the first reaction that we have here is the exhaustive hydrogenation and that is going to be a reaction where we take our alkyne, some sort of alkyne doesn't matter what that alkyne is, and we are going to be reacting it with hydrogen on a heterogeneous catalyst. The heterogeneous catalyst in this case is going to be palladium. However, in addition to palladium, you can see other examples like platinum or nickel that can be commonly used in this case as well. As soon as we do this reaction, we are going to end up with exhaustive hydrogenation, as I've mentioned, and this reaction does not stop at the formation of the double bond. Double bond is going to be an intermediate here, however, the double bond itself, the product, the alkene, it is more of an intermediate, so we're always going to go to the very end. Another important thing that I want to point out here is that this reaction is going to reduce everything. So if you have triple and double bonds in your molecule, everything is going to get nuked. So for instance, in this case, if I take this molecule and do a reaction with H2, I'm going to end up with the molecule with the final product where both triple and double bond have been reduced. So in other words, we got rid of everything. All right, moving on, I have a partial reduction with the Lindlor's catalyst and hydrogen. Well, first of all, what is the Lindlor's palladium or Lindlor's catalyst? Lindlor's catalyst is palladium that has been poisoned by heavy metals like lead, calcium, barium in the form of a sulfate or carbonate. Often Lindlor's catalyst is going to be calcium carbonate with other heavy metals and and palladium plated on top of that. And also, we are going to see quinoline as an organic poison sitting on top of that catalyst as well. The important feature of the Lindlor's catalyst is that when this reaction happens, it is going to give you a syn addition, the uh, resulting product is going to be a cis alkene, and that reaction will stop at the formation of the double bond. Which means that if you have, let's say, other double bonds in your molecule, they are going to be perfectly safe. Now, if we want to get a trans double bond and not cis double bond, we are going to use partial reduction with sodium in liquid ammonia. And one other thing that I want to point out here is that sodium in liquid ammonia is not the same thing as NaNH2, which is sodium amide. NaNH2, this compound, that is a strong base. Sodium in liquid ammonia, those are two separate substances, they are not combined together, they are not the part of the same molecule, they are two different things. In this case, as I've mentioned a moment ago, we are going to get the trans alkene, and just like in the previous case, we are going to stop at the formation of the double bond. Moving on to the next reaction, this is where we are going to see NaNH2 as a base. So now, that is not sodium and liquid ammonia, that is sodium amide. And when we have a terminal alkyne, uh, the terminal alkynes, they are acidic enough, so to speak, the pKa of this hydrogen over here on the terminal position is somewhere around 25-26, which means that we are uh, capable of pulling that off if we are going to use a sufficiently strong base. And sodium amide is such a base. So in the first step of this reaction, we are going to pull the uh, acidic proton from our terminal alkyne, forming alkynide anion. That alkynide anion is very basic and very nucleophilic, which is very important to us, because if we were to react that with the electrophile, like let's say CH3I, then I'm going to undergo a simple SN2 reaction, giving me a new carbon-carbon bond, which, as you can imagine, is very important in organic chemistry, because 
if we can create new carbon-carbon bonds, we can assemble complex molecules from something very simple and build something really cool out of our molecules. Now, the important thing that I want to point out here is that this reaction only works for primary alkyl halides. That is the biggest limitation of this synthetic procedure. And the good choices here would be, let's say, like what I have here in this list, I have the allyl bromide or benzyl bromide or just regular butyl bromide. All of these guys are primary alkyl halides, so they will work just fine. However, if you were to do this reaction with, let's say, a secondary alkyl halide like this one, cyclohexyl bromide, or if you want to go with the IUPAC name, that's going to be bromocyclohexane, well, in this case, as I've mentioned a moment ago, alkynide ionine is a very powerful nucleophile, but it is equally powerful base, which means that in this case, we are actually going to see the E2 reaction, and your result is going to be an alkene instead of the new new carbon-carbon bond uh, that you might have wanted to create here. So if you need to put a new carbon-carbon bond, make sure that it is a primary alkyl halide and not secondary or a tertiary one. All right. Moving on to the hydrohalogenation, this is a classic reactions of alkenes and equally classic reactions of alkynes. And because this reaction is very similar between the two types of functional groups, we are going to see a lot of similarities here. In the first step, we are going to end up with an anti-addition where the hydrogen is going to end up on the less substituted carbon of our alkyne, and bromine is going to end up on the more substituted carbon of our alkyne. We teach this reaction as if it goes through the formation of the carbocation when we are talking about the mechanism of this reaction. However, the reality is a little bit more complicated than that, and the experimental data suggests that this reaction actually is, a, is an example of a thermolecular reaction, and we do not form a real carbocation here. Because of that, we are not going to see any problems associated with our carbocations, like, let's say, rearrangements. Now, the middle step here, this anti-addition giving you the corresponding alkene that I have here on the screen is typically not the end product. Of course, on paper and in the textbook, we can say that we can only react with, you know, one equivalent of HBr. But if we were to bring the second equivalent of HBr, then we are going to end up with a geminal dihalide. In this reaction, the important thing to keep in mind that our halogens, whether it's bromine, chlorine, or whatever else, they are always going to end up on the same carbon. So you're always going to end up with a geminal dihalide. This is a very important thing to remember, so never put your halogens on the opposite carbons. They always got to be on the same carbon here. So I can say that this reaction follows the Markovnikov rule and gives us the Markovnikov product. And as I've mentioned a moment ago, we do not see any carbocation rearrangements because in reality, we actually do not form any carbocations there either. Next reaction is going to be equally as classic of a reaction of alkenes as alkynes. That is going to be just a simple halogenation reaction. Like in the previous case, we can do that in two different steps. In step number one, we are going to end up with an anti-addition of our halogens across the triple bond, giving us the corresponding alkene. Now, like in the previous case, here we also don't have to stop at this point, and we can proceed with the second addition of a halogen. In this case, you are going to get a tetrahalide, and you are going to have halogens everywhere in your molecule. For the exam purposes, sometimes instructors will say, just show me the product where the single halogen molecule is going to be adding across our triple bond, and what they want to see, what they are going to be testing for, is the fact that this is an anti-addition, so you would have to show your bromines being trans to each other. Now, next reaction is a catalytic hydration. So this is a reaction where we are going to be adding water across our triple bond. And this reaction can be accomplished by using either H2 as a catalyst 
or mercury 2 plus. In the case when we are going to be using mercury, this reaction sometimes is referred to as the Kucherov uh, reaction, an interesting historic factoid here. Kucherov, who has discovered the hydration reaction of alkynes, did end up poisoning himself with mercury uh, because he never uh, followed the, any you know, safety procedures when it comes to working with highly toxic compounds like mercury. So make sure that whenever you're working with anything that is even a little bit toxic in the lab, you always follow all safety procedures. That stuff is extremely important. Anyways, getting back to our chemistry here. When we do reaction of alkyne with water in the presence of one of those catalysts, we are going to first end up with an enol. The enol intermediate here is quite unstable and it is going to undergo very quick ketoenol totomerism, giving us the corresponding ketone. The mechanism of this reaction is something that some instructors do test, some instructors do not test. So make sure you clear that with your instructor if you do need to know the key to enaltotomerism, and if you do, make sure you can do this reaction with your eyes closed, because in my experience, whenever key to enaltotomerism is something that your instructors did tell you about, they are definitely going to test for it. So remember that this reaction gives you the Markovnikov product, where the oxygen going to end up on the more substituted carbon of what used to be an alkyne, and double, triple, quadruple check the mechanism for the keto enol totomerism if you are responsible for that mechanism. Now, moving on, we have another reaction that ends up putting an OH onto our alkyne, and that one is a hydroboration oxidation reaction. Unlike the reaction with alkenes, where we just use a simple borane, BH3, in the case of alkynes, the reaction is not selective enough with a regular borane so we end up using borane with some bulky groups on that. The examples of that is going to be 9-BBN, which stands for 9-borbicyclonone, the disimyl borane or dicyclohexyl borane. All these three compounds are very common ones that you are going to be using in your course, and chances are your instructor have introduced at least one of those, if not all three of those compounds. Now, when we are doing this reaction, the bulky borane is going to orient itself in such a way as to put itself onto the less substituted carbon of our triple bond, and consequently, through this reaction, we are going to end up with the OH on that group. The reaction, just like with the case of the alkenes, is going to be a syn addition, although it's not going to matter because the next step we are going to do is the keto enol totomerism again because the intermediate that we have here is the enol molecule. In this particular case, the keto enol totomerism gives us the aldehyde, so again, if you need to know the mechanism for that reaction, make sure that you do know it very well because instructors love to test for that. One other thing that I want to point out about this reaction, that this reaction gives us the anti-Markovnikov product, if you want to think about it this way, because the OH and the corresponding oxygen of the aldehyde going to end up on the less substituted carbon of our triple bond, and our bulky boranes like 9-BBM and diacyamyl borane and all of these guys, they are extremely sensitive towards any kind of steric hindrances. Which means that if you have an alkyne not at the end of the molecule, not a terminal alkyne, like what I have here on the screen, but let's say you have an alkyne in the middle of the molecule, then by using bulky borane, you can still choose the regioselectivity of this reaction appropriately by orienting your borane away from whatever side of the molecule is bulkier. Now, next I have a funky little reaction, hydroxyhalogenation of alkynes, which sometimes is covered, sometimes is not covered, depending on what your instructor likes to do in class, and depending on which type of a textbook you guys are using. In this case, this reaction reaction is very similar to a similar reaction of alkenes, where we are going to end up adding bromine, or whatever halogen you have, and OH across our pi bonds. So in this case, we are going to end up with the OH on the more substituted carbon, so reaction follows the Markovnikov rule, and bromine, which acts as our electrophile, on the less substituted atom of a double bond. Now, here, like in the previous two cases, we are going to end up with the enol intermediate, although this is a funny looking enol because it also has a bromine sitting on it, but nonetheless, 
this part of the molecule over here that is still an enol. And because it is an enol, it is going to be rather unstable, which means that it is going to undergo the keto enol totemerization, giving us the final product being a ketone. And since oxygen here ends up on the more substituted carbon, we're going to say that this reaction is the Markovnikov product. So, it follows the Markovnikov rule if you like to think about it from this perspective. And finally, we have the ozonolysis of alkynes. Just like alkenes, ozonolysis is the type of the oxidative cleavage that is going to cut through our triple bond. And unlike alkenes, in the case of the ozonolysis of alkynes, we do not really need any specific workup. With alkenes, we had either oxidative or reductive workup. With alkynes, it's just ozone and water and that's it. In the case of alkynes, every single time we are going to end up with carboxylic acids. That is always going to be our final product for this reaction. So, cut through alkyne, take every uh, carbon that was a part of the uh, triple bond and turn that into the corresponding carboxylic acid and that's it. So as you can see, alkynes are quite similar to alkenes in many of their reactions with just a few twists here and there. And because of their similarities, it is a good idea to review those together. So the next time you're reviewing for the test, either it's going to be alkenes or alkynes, mix things up a little bit. Hope you guys liked this overview. If you did, you can show it to me by hitting the like button and sharing this video with your classmates to help promote it and help more students see it. Leave me your questions and feedback in the comments below. I read all comments and your questions help me come up with new ideas for daily videos. As always, thanks for watching, subscribe to the channel for daily organic chemistry updates, watch this video next and I will see you tomorrow!